All right, Wildlings, you wanted the best. You got the best. The hottest podcast in Louisville, Kentucky, Sean versus Wild. And guess what? It's time to rock and roll all night and podcast every Tuesday. You're hanging out with the man, the myth, the Sean Thriller Smith, the guy putting rad back into talk radio. <laughs> Maybe you've heard of me. And today in the virtual Smithsonian, it truly is Sean versus Wild because I'm joined by Sean Milkey, guitarist slash vocalist of Alice Anna. Dude, Alice Anna was my jam back in the mid 2000s. So I was super stoked to have Sean on the show. And also, Sean and I carried on a working relationship as he is the founding father, if you will, of Revival Recordings. And you guys might remember that Uh Huh Baby Yeah's last album, Illuminasty, came out on Revival Recordings. You might also know that uh, Lee Jennings from The Funeral Portrait, remember him back in episode 33? Funeral Portraits on Revival Recordings. They have a lot of great bands on there. We'll actually be showcasing a hot up-and-coming band called Shatterproof on the show today. So, guys, you're definitely not going to want to sleep on that. But, of course, you're not going to. You're already here. You already made the effort, guys. So I know you're going to stick around. And the, the conversation is fantastic today because Sean and I are two big fans of music in general. We're going to talk about Alice Anna, but we're also going to talk about Of course, revival recordings, Uh, but we talk about things like what we liked about music as kids and what we think about uh, the music industry uh, in present, where we want to see it go in the future. It was a great in-depth convo, so very happy on how it turned out. Very happy that Sean was able to join me via Virtual Smithsonian today. Um, Also, guys, I'm very happy about my sponsor at AudiophileInc.com. I'm talking about Shane at AudiophileInc.com, and I think you're going to be happy with them too because if you have a band or a podcast or an idea or a business and you got to get your stuff out there, you got to get your stuff screen printed on a T-shirt or a tank top or a sweet pair of underwear, Shane's got your back. He's going to get you taken care of, giving you the designs you want on the brands that you want with the best price in town, no matter what town you live in, mind you, because he's going to ship to all 50 nifty United States. So check out audiophileinc.com, A-U-D-I-O-P-H-I-L-E-I-N-K.com, and you tell him the wild man sent you. And also, guys, while I'm referring you some sweet businesses to check out, you got to check out my brand new sponsor at Audible. You guys know Audible. It's an Amazon company. It's going to give you a free audiobook just for listening to the Sean vs. Wild podcast. How do you ask? Well, let me tell you how. Get on your desktop or your laptop. Go to audibletrial.com slash Sean vs. Wild, S-E-A-N-V-S-W-I-L-D. Audiotrial.com slash Sean vs. Wild. Sign in with your Amazon account. Start your free 30 days. Get the audiobook of your choosing, and guys, they have over 180,000 books to choose from. So if you're a Dune fan like me, maybe you like the Star Wars Extended Universe, maybe you want to check out It, maybe you want to check out The Handmaiden's Tale. I reference these a lot because very popular. I know a lot of people on my Facebook reading these. So if you want to check it out via audiobook, you can do that for free. It's all on the Sean vs. Wild podcast. And check it out when you do that, Audible They've got some pretty deep pockets. They're going to help me out. They're going to help the show out. They're going to help keep the lights on and the keg filled here at the Smithsonian. So I definitely appreciate that. Also, when it comes to appreciation, you know where I'm going with this. I'm appreciating Joe Brock for booping the dials, staying up late. He's a college man now, and he's still helping me with the podcast. Joe, you are the man, broski. Also, I appreciate each and every one of you, as always, for tuning in weekend and week out. Or if you're brand new, I appreciate you stumbling upon the show, giving this one a chance, checking out what the, uh, what Sean Milkey has to say today. Uh, thank you so much for finding it. If you like what you hear, please like share and subscribe across social media. It's on iTunes. It's on Stitcher. It's wherever you get podcasts. It's on YouTube. Like my Facebook page, follow me on Twitter, whatever you can do. Just one little click goes a very long way. So I appreciate everything that you've done for me. I appreciate you tuning in. And you know what? You're going to appreciate the fact that I'm already four and a half minutes into this intro. It's time to wrap it up and let's get to the conversation with Sean Milkey from Alisana. So tune in, turn up, let's get wild. (laughs) 
All right, so I'm a Sean, you're a Sean, and uh, the very first day we met, it was key when we introduced each other. It was like, oh, I'm Sean. Oh, I'm Sean. Uh, we had to ask each other that famous Sean question. You know what question I'm talking about. Of course, it's it's how do you spell your name? I feel like every time as a Sean, I meet a Sean, it's like the uh, like an old Western, and that, that cliche Western music starts playing as we stare each other down to find out what kind of Sean we are. Yeah, I got to know what kind of Sean I'm dealing with here, buddy. It's an unspoken rule. Right. If one Sean meets another... You have to ask how you spell it, and, and we and, we came to and a it's conclusion. It's so funny because there's there's still there's, there's still a respect afterwards. Because I mean, you're still a Sean, but when when you find out the spelling's different, there's still there's a level of uh of uh concern there. I, yeah. I think you know you always you're always side eyeing a Sean who spells differently. <laughs> exactly. You 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 now now you know you have to tread lightly. Okay, a line yeah, has been exactly. drawn in your friendship sand. <laughs> so. That is uh, we were able to get over it pretty quick because I'm an S E A N, you're an S H A W N, and while you know we kind of came to that conclusion that while an S E A N might think he's right and an S H A W N might think their spelling's right, we can rest we easy. One equal enemy. Yes. We will have one equal enemy. We can rest he's easy right at night UN. knowing that we're not an S H A U N. Absolutely. So we are. Any U- We're united in the hatred for the UN. <laughs> That's true. And any UNs out there listening, just unsubscribe to my podcast. Come on. Do, <laughs> Please do, just stop listening. Just do us both a favor here, any SHA UNs. Just kidding. Uh, this is uh, <laughs> Anybody can listen, guys. I'm an equal opportunity podcaster. So. <laughs> but, I, picture that same, I picture that same Western scenario where... We're staring each other down, but then a UN walks in, and we both just turn our pistols on him. Yeah, exactly. And kind of just give each other a knowing nod. Yeah, we we uh, tip our hats and uh, then yeah go back and uh, go back to uh, our own uh, old west business, <laughs> prospecting and uh, you know stagecoach robbing. I guess, <laughs> of course. <laughs> so, guys, this is truly the Sean versus Wild podcast today. It's the Sean's versus Wild podcast. I'm your host, as Hello. always, Sean Thriller Smith. Joining me by way of the virtual Smithsonian. You're in Raleigh, North Carolina, correct? That is correct. The power of the internet, guys. The power of the phone lines. Uh, in the virtual Smithsonian Indeed. here, I've got Sean Milk, guitarist and vocalist for Alisana. Alisana, put this to bed for me, please. Put this to rest. What's the proper pronun- pronunciation of the band name? Well, I will go ahead and put two things to bed for you. The proper pronunciation of my last name is Milky, and the proper pronunciation of my band name is Alisana. Alisana. Man, now I feel mm-hmm. dumb. You know what? I'm just going to edit that out. Sean Milky. I always just call you <laughs> Milkman, the Milkman. Yeah, that's that's totally fine. My nickname has been, well, it was Milk all through high school. So Perfect. even I got confused as to how the hell it was said. I just figured it was a silent E. You know, I got to watch out for you WNs. You're throwing silent E's at me and everything. <laughs> it's so interesting how the silent E is apparently so prominent in our language that even on a, added to the end of a word like milk, you just assume you don't say it. As in, why would you ever spell milk with the E to begin with, right? That's true. But also, I feel if it was milky, there'd be a Y there. But you can rest easy knowing that not only you are you not the first person to mispronounce my band name, you are also nowhere near the first person to mispronounce my last name either. So. You know, I've heard it called, I've heard your band called Alisana for a long time, but I always, growing up, it was Alisana, and then I feel like someone poisoned my well, no pun intended, by calling it Alisana, so now I was like, "Oh yeah, Alisana," but then I don't know, man. Something about it. So now, I've, you know what? I'm glad that you settled this, guys. We are getting down to the hot topics right off the bat. It's Milky, it's Alisana, and then you can put that in your pipe and smoke it. I told uh, I told this story before to friends and whatnot, but we've actually had people in the early days of our career shout from the crowd, correcting us on how we were saying the band name. And that is no lie or exaggeration. And there's there's no surreal moment quite like when a complete stranger is trying to correct you on the name of something that you invented. <laughs> <laughs> the name that I came up with in my bedroom, uh, you know, 15 years ago. <laughs> How did the... Uh, was it 15 years ago? How did the name come about? Was it, a, was it one of those things where you're lying in bed doodling in your, in your high school notebook? No. Um, it was actually... And Patrick who started the band with me, we played in a 
two bands before Alisana together, but the middle band was also called Alisana, and the whole reason was because we were living on the street at the time, and we we knew we wanted to name the band kind of a made-up word, and the street we lived on was spelled Alisana, like two girls' names, and we were just like, oh, what if we just change the spelling up and, and make it fun that way, and that way it seems as if it's a made-up word, but actually still maintains some, you know, emotional uh, devotion to us, so that's what we went with it. That's clever. That's kind of like a, the Aerosmith scenario. You know, and they're like, hey, here's just a, a made up word or maybe the word I think was, I don't know. And then uh, it sounds good when you put it together like that. Right. Yeah. And I just feel like, I mean, look, I've been lucky to not have to name a band in a, in a very long time, but let's not lie about it. Naming a band is not only is it incredibly difficult, but it, it can be very crucial as well. I honestly think there are bands in the history of music who part of their popularity bled from the fact that they had a cool name or a catchy name or a, a name that just fit what they were doing, what was going on. So I think just like naming a band, something great can help. I think naming a band, something really poor can hurt. And, you know, it's, and you never know it at the time, you know, you don't know if you're going to be right or wrong or anything like that. So to be honest with you, the, the mispronunciation and, and all that that's kind of followed us has helped a lot because it actually became, a quote unquote theme thing of whether or not you were saying our band name right and you know it's the kind of press that you can't buy. Let me ask you this question. Uh you're talking about a good band name that helps and a bad name that hurts. What are some examples of bands that you think have awesome band names? And what are some examples of bands that have horrible band names? I'm gonna put you on the spot. <clears throat> you can put me on the spot, but I'll I'll kind of <laughs> skirt your question in my own kind of way and in that I'll go more broad with it in that like a band like a Spitalfield, for example, who are from Chicago, they used to be on Victory. I love that band name because I just didn't know what the hell it meant. I, I think I'm always more drawn to band names where, similar to Alison, like I hear the name and I go, what is that or why is that? Um, you know, it's a lot of times it tend to be one word names. Uh, we just played a show this last with a band called Acaria, and I'm probably saying that wrong, which is ironic, I know. <laughs> um, but I like it because I'm like, I don't know what the hell that means. And But then, with all due respect to all the crown bands out there, for the longest time, I feel like every band that was coming out was either talking about crowns or empires, and it just it got to the point where it was just like 10 different bands had the same name, but just in a different order. And those kinds of band names lose me. It almost makes me not even want to check out that band because it just, it just sounds lazy to me, you know, with all due respect to any band with the words Crown or Empire in them, um, especially Crown the Empire, who happens to have both, um, which I actually like their band, funny enough. But uh, it's just, I, I, I like when it sounds like a band paid attention to the fact that we want our band name to only sound or to only be associated to our band. I think, especially in the age of the internet and Google searches and Facebook searches and things of that nature, if you name your band like, I don't know, Refrigerator, right? You're going to type Refrigerator into a Google search and you're going to find a fucking Refrigerator. You're not going to find the band called Refrigerator. I mean, I think there's a band out there right now called Microwave, right? Like, why? Why on <laughs> earth would you name your band something that is a, a household appliance? Something like, that will be difficult to, f to find in a search engine. Exactly. And now if your band blows up beyond belief, then it, it's no longer a problem. I get that. But in the early days of your band, when you're expecting the casual fan who attends your show, who maybe didn't grab a sticker, who maybe didn't grab a CD, who's just trying to find your band, it's going to make it more challenging. It just is. So I've always appreciated bands who have names that can only be associated to their project. I agree. Uh, and also, there's a big trend right now uh, with, uh, by the way, I'll tell you a band name that rocks. Like, what? just a band name that I think just has made a band that's awesome, even more awesome, Pantera. To me, like, oh, like yeah. that's like the one of the coolest band names ever. Like, we're just called Pantera. That rocks. Right, and it's short, it's sweet, it rolls off the tongue. It's, it's the type of word that you're going to associate to them and to them only. And it, it, believe me, in like the subliminal nature of the way people view things, that absolutely matters it, it, because it's going to happen more quickly. You don't have to disassociate the word from something else and then reassociate it to them. You just automatically associate it to them. Yeah, exactly. I'm surprised though, talking about just band names or, or, uh, issues, issues like that, like you were talking about, I've seen like a trend 
and I've mentioned this on a couple other podcasts where it's like, t- say you have just like a simple uh, word, like your band is called, I don't know, like you just take a cool word, like, I don't know, let's say your band's called Rockets, all right? And then it's sure. like, we named our band Rockets, and I'm like, well, surely there's about 10,000 other bands also named this one word plural thing that you like. You know, and people are like hey, that's our band name, and I'm like, well, how are, is anybody going to tell the difference between you and anyone else if you're just a one? Oh yeah, man. I mean, I'll, <laughs> and I'll I'll tell you too with, with running the label and, and getting submissions and things like I, I I try my hardest not to be immediately turned off by it, but when we get a submission from a band and I go to look that band up and there's 15 bands with the same name because the name is like you just said, Rockets or something that's so so clearly could have been named that by another band. It just begs the question, you didn't think, like, in this day and age, with information that literally sits in the palm of your hand on your phone, you didn't think to, to take 30 seconds and make sure there weren't 14 other bands named the thing you're about to name your band? Exactly. And I get that it makes your job a little bit harder. You have, to, you have to think a little bit harder, maybe get a little more creative. But isn't that also the point? Like, is there no desire to make yourself stand out in the easiest way possible, and that's come up with something that nobody else has come up with to name your band. <laughs> exactly. I, I'm thinking maybe maybe it's like one of those scenarios where it's like, okay, man, you know, maybe these names were just taken in the '60s, and now they're not together anymore, and it's irrelevant. So we'll just drop the the and maybe take the vowels out or put a z at the end or something, and we we sure, will be sure. we will be animals or zombies or beetles. Or stones, you know, from here on out, and it's like, sure, yeah, <clears throat> yep, you, you can't do it. Music is timeless. These bands are gonna live forever. You can't do it, bro. Yeah, they're gonna live forever, and like, there's just there's an infinite amount of possibilities out there to where it just it almost comes off as moderately lazy when you just land on a band name that you probably know somebody else has already picked as a band name, and I get it. Maybe it's associated to your art and your vision and all that, but. You know, that's why the English language created synonyms, right? Just find another way to keep your point across. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> so uh, now that we're talking about band names, let's just talk about your band. How about let's go ahead and just dive headfirst right into that. So you're living on Alice Anna Street, and you name your band Alice Anna. And where do you guys start? Like, wh- where, are you, where are you located out of originally when you guys start the band? So so we <clears throat> we all came from different walks of life, but we're where Patrick and I really sort of conceived Allison and what it would eventually become. Uh, we were living in a giant warehouse uh, block away from the water in Fells Point in Baltimore. And it was everything you would hope you could live in as an early 20 something dude trying to start a rock band. Like it was just awesome. It was Super tall. It was literally just an empty cement building that we threw some bunk beds in, and we were able to set all of our gear up in a front room and practice until five in the morning if we wanted to, because it was in you know in the heart of Fells Point, and there's just noise everywhere anyway, so there was never any concern there. And um, it just and it's cool because it always it always kind of stuck with us going forward, even when we decided to, to move the band down to Raleigh. Was that that idea of it doesn't matter if we stay up till five or six a.m. to get done what we've got to do. That's what we have to do. And and living in the city and living in those hours, I think really benefited us in the early days of the band because we were able to work jobs all day long and and fund the band, fund everything we we're trying to do, and then get home at midnight from a restaurant job and stay up till six in the morning working on the band because we were already so conditioned to get creative in those hours. Right. So yeah, you can make it work around your schedule no matter what schedule you work. Right, exactly, and, and the city life definitely helped to do that. <laughs> and also, too, I, whenever I ever listen to the first, at least the first Alice Santa albums that we ever got uh, or made was ever made available to uh, me here in the the heart of the Midwest. Uh, whenever I was a kid, <laughs> I always thought that Alice Santa was a big, like, kind of amalgam of influences. Never, it was it was kind of a mixture in a good way but just have a lot of sound. So it's very hard to put your finger on like what exactly it's a mix of genres. It's a mix of uh, a lot of different things. What were some of your influences or what were some of your ideas going forward in the early years as far as songwriting and, and 
things of that nature. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's an awesome observation because that's definitely a part of what we pride ourselves on. And it's cool, too, because, you know, it started off with Pat and I, who came from very different musical backgrounds. And as Alicenta became what it was with its members, you know, in finding Dennis and finding Jeremy and finding Shane, it still holds true. Like, we all come from such diverse musical influence, whereas we all have, you know, influences that cross over, don't get me wrong, but we, but at our, at our core, we're all from, from such different walks of musical life. And so when we started the band, and I think it's like when you start anything, you know, you got to fine tune it. You know, the, the first version of anything is not the version that matters. You know, if you're a filmmaker, your first edit, your first movie you shoot, like n- none of that is any good. But all of that contributes to what eventually becomes something good and something worthwhile. And, you know, so the early Alessandra stuff was kind of over the top with, oh, no, 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 we're going to be like five things at once. And then you would listen back to a song and it literally was five different things and it was terrible. (laughs) And so it was this idea of trying to go, okay, well, you know, I come from a huge pop punk background and Pat comes from a huge classical rock background and Dennis comes from a nothing but metal background and, how do we get those things to come together and work and blend? And I think that's what the really early Alicenta stuff, the Frail Wing stuff, the more Miss Basil Legend stuff, I think you hear a lot of that there in those two albums. And I think with the emptiness, when we finally got there was when we had actually coined our own sound because all of those influences had finally just blended together and became this one thing that's, the Alessandra sound, you know, even with our most recent records, people go, yeah, it sounds different, it sounds cool, but you still hear that it's Alessandra, and that's, that's a compliment. That's a huge compliment to have a sound that people go, oh, that sounds like them. That's yeah. a tough thing to pull off, and it takes years and years of working together and forming that sound for that to occur. Yeah, exactly. It's important to sound uh, like yourselves, but it's also important to keep pushing yourself, especially as an artist, oh. even, even for your own sake. It's like, I can't put out the same record over and over and over again. No, in fact, you know, if, if I ever kind of nope out of a band and stop listening to them, it'll be for that very reason. You know, it's, 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 it's sort of a double-edged sword there, right? So you, you got two different types of fans. You got the fan who wants you to make your first record 10 different times. They just want to keep hearing the same thing because they hold this nostalgic connection to to your first record. And for them, that is what your band is. And if you ever sound different than that, then they don't care. And then you have your fans who actually care about music and care about art and respect the fact that true artists develop over time. They mature over time. Like, I'm not going to write the same record when I'm about to turn 38 as I wrote when I was 22. And if I tried to, it would sound so foolish and so naive and so contrived that I would hope that any fan of music would be able to sniff that out and go, what is this dude trying to do? So it really is a balance you have to walk of not completely disrespecting your fan base by just abandoning everything that you are, but also respecting your fan base by giving them something fresh and something new and something that speaks to where you are now. Yeah, and there's nothing more, uh, I don't know, uh, I don't want to use such harsh language, but to me, like there's a certain amount of it being pathetic when you see somebody like, um, you know, for me, like if you ever see the band Rascal Flats, okay, who's like a talented country <laughs> music artist, like or a group of talented country music artists, but they dress like they're, you know, 25 years old or, you know what I'm saying? Sure. Or you, you, you know, kind of like that, that, uh, uh, speech in The Wedding Singer where it's like, hey, you know what happened to Arthur Fonzarelli and Vinnie Barbarino? Their shows got canceled because no one wants to see a 40-year-old guy hitting on chicks. Like, at a certain point, you <laughs> have... reference, by the way. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> at a certain point, you have to start growing as you grow. You can't just, you know... The only band, I think, that has ever not had to do that was ACDC. They put out the same record over and over for 40 years. Yeah, it's funny, and it's too, right? Yeah, <laughs> Oh, yeah. And certainly, I mean, let's be real here. Like, there's always exceptions to every rule, right? right. I mean, that's, you, but you can't live inside those exceptions because that's why they're called exceptions to the rule, right? And if you're trying to actually, you know, and, and to kind of put a, a bow on, on this opinion here, is I, I grew up around the Beatles. That's what my dad was obsessed with, my mom was obsessed with. I, I read every book on the Beatles I could get my hands on when I was, you know, 11, 12, 13 years old. And, 
the thing that always fascinated me the most about them and, and the thing I've always held, the expectation I've always held myself to was, yeah, in the early days, they were this bubblegum pop band. They always had to include two or three covers on every record and do this, and they were, they were playing the game by somebody else's rules. Right. But as soon as they were able to play it by their own rules, they did. Like, the second that opportunity presented itself, they, they went right after it. And that, that's how I've tried to live my career, is that the second any of those windows started to crack open, I would sliver any part of my artistic self through that crack and try to start to exploit that. And, and now here we are with having our own label and being able to do literally whatever we want. And it's, I feel like that. I feel like the way they were. And, you know, it's, it's because I studied them so much and loved them so much that I've tried to be, keep my artistic self in, in the vein that they were. Yeah, I think that their early albums, you know, obviously put their face on the cover of the teen magazines and made them become a household name. But whenever they started playing by their own rules, you know, that's what made them timeless. I mean, the the Beatles will literally never, ever go out of style. And, you know, 200 years from now, if popular music is still a thing, people are still going to be listening to the Beatles, you know? Oh, there's, there's no question about it. No question about it. And it's, and it's funny, I'm, I thought you were about to say one thing there, and I'm kind of glad you did, and I thought you were going to be like, and then, and then once it became this other thing, that's when, you know, they became great. Because here's the thing, like, <clears throat> people will tease me a lot because I listen to a lot of country music. My wife and I listen to country music. We were just listening to it tonight, and it's funny how some people can be so turned off by rap or by country or by techno or by, by whatever it is. And to me, I think the true measure of a person's interest in art is the ability to appreciate all of it. And I can love the white album. I can love Sgt. Pepper just as much as I love Please Please Me. Yeah, like exactly. for, for such totally different reasons. But I don't like one more than the other because all oh, that one's more artistic and that makes it cooler. Like bullshit. Please please me was fucking fantastic. And because of Please Please Me and its success, they were able to do Sgt. Pepper and they were able to do the White Album. And I think that's what so many people fail to see is that commercial success like that can allow some great artists, the canvas, to do something truly great. Exactly. I'm a big Beatles fan also. What's your favorite Beatles album? Let me ask you. Yes, it's so crazy because my dad, I love hanging out with my dad when we talk about the Beatles because it just always changes, right? It just, it has to. It has to always change, like exactly. just based on mood. But I would say that if there's one that I go to that's like this, like if I'm like, I want to listen to Beatles, the one I'll always turn on is Revolver. That's my always my go to. That kind of gets me back into a Beatles mode for a month or two. I'm almost right there with you because my favorite is Rubber Soul. But I'm in the yeah, same so time frame. Right? I was literally sitting, right, I was literally sitting here thinking, do I say Revolver or Rubber Soul? Because my dad will tell you in any like, you know, Beatles fan who's in their 60s or 70s will tell you, like, those albums are almost viewed as one album, like Revolver and Rubber Soul. Like, that's that same exact era. Like, it, it could have almost been a double album, kind of like a Melancholy by Smashing Pumpkins. Like, an album where it just has the same vibe and the same tones and the same feel. Yeah, I agree. Those are two of my absolute favorites, but, you know, uh, just like you were saying, that always changes. Because sometimes, you know, like, I got on a real, um, like... Abbey Road kick not not too long ago maybe a year ago and I was just like man this is so this is such like a heavy album and honestly like if you listen to Abbey Road to me it's not much different than listening to say something like Black Sabbath's uh, self-titled album that came out roughly the same time and you're like this is the Beatles like just playing heavy blues music especially that that second side is just super heavy Oh, the tones on that record are so dark. They're 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 almost like so anti Beatles, but you know it's the Beatles, so they pull it off. But it's so much darker than than previous stuff. I think the reason too to to wrap up the Revolver Rubber Soul talk is I feel like that era of the Beatles is that perfect center of the Beatles. It's it's everything that's before it and it's everything that's after it together. Yeah, it's like where everything they... before it felt. Go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, I would say everything before it felt like this one way. It, it's almost like view like a rainbow kind of, right? Like Revolver and Rubber Soul are like at the top of that rainbow. You know, it's like on its way up to, to what it was and on its way down to something else. It's like that right there was that perfect blend of everything, the Beatles. 
Dude, I'm getting pumped talking about the Beatles, so I'm sorry <laughs> for if I interrupt you on this one. So I know we're both. Pumped no, about no, it. please, dude. I, but I, I was going to say, the Beatles to me, <laughs> that that period, that period, that era, Rubber Soul Revolver, um, that is when they were they have mastered what they were, and they were just on the cusp of what they were going to become. Basically, we're saying the exactly. same thing here, but that's right in that yep. that point where it's like. Where are they going to go from here? And then they're just going to blow your right. mind from there. That's exactly what they're going to do. You definitely said it better than me. That was perfectly <laughs> said. Hey, man, I kind of like them being the apex of a rainbow. You know, that's pretty cool. <laughs> you should you should say that to your wife. Be like, you know what? You're the apex of a rainbow. She'll probably be like, that's the nicest <laughs> thing, and I don't even know what that means. I am absolutely writing that down and using that one. Too. Yeah, and just follow it up with, you know, like the Beatles. And she'll be like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, never oh, mind. Yeah. <laughs> never mind. I'm going to go to bed. <laughs> so, <laughs> but yeah, you know, early, uh, you know, talking about uh, musical influences, when I first got a hold of uh, the Alisana records, it was kind of at a time when other music for me uh, that I was listening to was as equally chaotic. I don't know if you've ever heard of these bands, but I'm just going to drop some names out there and uh, you just let me know. Mm -hmm. But uh, of course, like, it came out roughly around the same time when I was into, like, say, Blood Brothers. If you remember Blood Brothers. Sure. My uh, drummer, Jeremy, is an enormous Blood Brothers fan. There you go. Uh, a band like The Plot to Blow Up the Eiffel Tower. They were uh, on the touring circuit around that same time, kind of like Blood Brothers. I remember that band. Kind of chaotic. Yeah. Um, uh, but there's one band that I actually think vocally and just kind of the the way it goes, that to me it sounded the most like, and that's why I got into Alice Santa because I was really into this band. Have you ever uh, heard of the band or remember the band Anatomy of a Ghost? Oh, wow, yeah. I think we played a couple of shows with them, like in the very early days. But yeah, I'm definitely familiar with them. Yeah, they were. They put out one album, or an album and an EP, I think, on Equal Vision, probably around 2003 and four. Uh, and then they later became a band called Portugal the Man, which most people have heard of. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, Portugal was also on Fearless at the same time as us, actually. Really? Well, I'll be mm -hmm. darned. Hmm. So I remember the first time we got to raid the Fearless office, like which, by the way, when you're in your early 20s and you're signed to your first big label and you get to walk into their office and like, yeah, take whatever you want. It's like, it's like a kid on Christmas, but like on crack. Like you've never <laughs> felt cooler in your entire life. And you're like, you mean, I, well, I don't know if kids today would know it, but like you just got to take any CD you wanted and as many as you wanted. Like, I just remember getting back to the van with like a stack of CDs that like was it that cliche dude in the movie like but like in the library of like some famous college he's holding it under his chin you know like <laughs> the top book is under his chin and the bottom ones are like at the tips of his fingers like that was me with CDs and like falling out everywhere and it's just it was the coolest thing in the world and like you immediately just become the biggest fan of every record you're holding simply because, well, I got this from my label's office, and it's just, like, the coolest feeling in the world. Like, bands that I probably couldn't even name to you today, but for, like, the following year was just, like, my favorite band in the world, every one of them. I always wanted to, uh, and I remember submitting our early stuff to Fearless uh, back in the day, but there was a band from Indiana. I grew up in southern Indiana, but there was a band called Brazil from northern Indiana, and they put out their album on Fearless, and I was like, dude, if Brazil okay. can do it, we can do it, too. Brazil. Absolutely had the Brazil record. <laughs> Definitely one of the records in my stack under my chin. Yeah. And dude, what isn't there's not a better uh feeling or there wasn't when you just get new tangible musical items like a CD or record or however you like to collect. But there's not a better feeling than that. And you're how much time do we have? You're about to tap into a part of me that and it's it's funny because like, I, I think about this stuff a lot, is, especially with with turning thirty eight next month and just thinking about where I am in life and you know when did my dad become a curmudgeon and when do people become curmudgeony about the newer generations that are out and things like that and just the whole like well you just don't know how good you have and like right. and just thinking about things of like like how cool things were when I was your age like that kind of whole mentality but. I really, truly feel like for the first time, and it just might be the arrogance of my generation and where I am and the conceit that lies within everybody, everybody's generation, but it's like, you don't understand, you guys are about to lose tangible music. And there, 
I wish I could just sit kids down and make them realize just how fucking cool tangible music is. Yes. Like there was, to me, the artwork on the front, the, the sound of cracking open the CD case, the smell of that booklet when you opened it up, that was all equally as important as the tracks you were about to listen to. And now we live in an age where if you're bored with a song, you can shut it off 15 seconds into it and go listen to literal infinite options after that. And I, I think that if, if music doesn't figure out how to combat that, it's in a dangerous spot. Because I, I always make this joke to people that, have you ever eaten at the Cheesecake Factory? Oh, of course. Okay, everybody's pretty much eating Cheesecake Factory. My least favorite thing about the Cheesecake Factory is their menu is like 18 pages long, all right? When I go to a restaurant, I don't want to have to make a decision where I feel like I'm looking at an encyclopedia. Like, I want a handful of options that you specialize in, and then I want to choose from that, right? To me, that's what music has become. It's become the Cheesecake Factory menu. There's just too much to choose from. And when there's too much of something to choose from, you end up becoming complacent and jaded about it. It's like it's not even... The decision you make isn't even important. Or you just go, well, fuck it, I'm hungry, and i got to pick something to eat. Yeah, exactly. And that's what it feels like music is becoming. And that sucks, because I remember the 14-year-old me cracking open Dookie by Green Day and smelling that booklet and literally playing that same thing until it didn't work anymore and I had to go buy another copy. Like, that kind of passion, that kind of love for music that I fear may never exist again because it's just too out there. There's just too much of it out there. I agree. When I was a kid, it was one of those things where, you know, uh, you it's Christmas or it's your birthday or you've done your chores around the house, you got your allowance or whatever the case might be, or you, you begged your parents when you're at Circuit City, like, buy me a CD. And then they say, Circuit yes. City. You, Holy you, shit. <laughs> they're like, you know, yes, you can have one. Or here's $10 from your allowance. Go buy yourself one. And the thing is, is I would always take the time to, to look at all these different ones. Like, oh, should I get, you know, uh, this Nirvana CD or this Red Hot Chili Peppers? Or should I get this, uh, you know kiss cd or something like and you just look at the cover and then you kind of discriminate like oh this has a couple hits and what have you and then you finally make your purchase and then you take it home and you play it and whether it rocks or whether it sucks you're stuck with it It was yours (laughs) it was yours it belonged to you that's that's why man you made a decision and for better or for worse dude i i will will not lie there was definitely records when i was 14 15 16 years old that probably weren't very good but because I chose it, I loved it. Like, there's a particular band from the 90s who you may have heard of them, you may have not. And I, I bring this up to a lot of people whenever I have this type of conversation. And most of it, there was a band called Summer Camp. And they had a, a song called Drawer. Like, that was their hit. And that was the first track on the record. And Drawer ripped, man. They had a music video on MTV. Cool fucking song. The rest of the record is shit, okay? Like, I, I tried listening to it a couple years ago. I'm like, man, this is not a good record. But you bet your ass I used to listen to that record front to bottom. like Exactly. Front to back. Constantly. Because I chose, amongst the sea of other options in that music store, to take that with me. And that mattered. That mattered a great deal. Yeah, and you're not going to get another album for another month or so. Or for another couple weeks or so. Or until the next time you're at, you know, Circuit City. Exactly. (laughs) Or what I uh, I recall Christmas of probably, again... Everything that shapes you is somewhere in that 12 to 16 range, right? Sure. So it was one of those Christmases, and, you know, my parents asked me what I want, and I probably said whatever I said, a couple video games or whatever, this, that, and the other, and I probably gave them a list of 30 CDs. And I remember one year, my mom going like, like, babe, we can't get you all of these CDs. I'm like, don't give me anything else then. Like, I don't want anything but that music. Like, that's it. Like, those, like, because I loved having cds man like i just loved it so much and like i said i could I would, i'll go on till i'm rambling about this topic because it, it just makes me worry it, it it concerns me a great deal because i think that that part of music mattered a lot more than people right now 
want to admit. Sure. And also from uh, the flip side perspective where, you know, you're in a band. I was in a band. Uh, we worked together. That's how this whole podcast came about because we had a, a mutual relationship uh, through working together. Uh, and it's kind of one of those things where, you know, even if you're in a, you know, if you're in a band, look at it from this perspective. Like you put all your money, your time, your effort into making a record and then you throw it out there into the ether and then in, in this day and age, someone can listen to 15 seconds and be like, Psh, nah, I'm not into that band. On to the next band. You know? And it's like, it's man, truth, man, you spent years writing it. You spent months, you know, weeks recording it, months getting it all put together. And then you throw it out there into the digital ether. And people can literally just take 15 seconds and be like, nope, not my thing. On and do you know what's going to happen? And, and this is why I say music is in trouble. I think art is in trouble for the same reason. Just all, all forms of it is that really smart people who spend the money and make the decisions, they're eventually going to put less effort into it. Right now, we're transitioning back into a singles world, but not in the way that it was good in like the 80s and 90s where a single could launch a career and could turn people into millionaires. Right now, we're in a singles industry because it's like, why waste any more time? Because if somebody's only going to spend 15 seconds on your band... Why not make it on one song instead of spending your energy and time on 10 or 11 or 12? Right. And it's, it's terrifying. It's really terrifying because what's going to happen is it's going to water down art. It's going to make it shittier. It's going to make it come from less talented people. And I mean it with all due respect. But like, let's, let's be real here. There are people who are born to do something and super, super talented at it. And there are people who have great intentions and want to do it. But now it's getting harder to tell the difference between the two. Right. Right. Like, you think, of, like, to, to look at a parallel art form in, in filmmaking, you look at something like a Netflix, right? You just have this plethora. You have the Cheesecake Factory menu on Netflix. And I promise you, there's equal parts great films and equal parts like, how the hell did this film ever get made? But now it's harder to tell the difference because it all looks the same and it all smells the same. And it's all coming from the same place in the, in, in the common perspective. And it's, that's not a good thing. There, it's not a good thing to not be able to separate great from average. I agree. And I'm sure you're probably like me, but do you spend more time looking for movies on Netflix? I spend more time on the menu than I do on the movies itself. I'm like, okay, I got to flip through Dude, all these. Should I, should I waste my time on this? Should I crank up this season? What should I do here? Right. It's the absolute truth. And I think a great part of the reason that you have that pause is because you've experienced the average on Netflix, right? You've, you've had that time where you pick this film out and you watch 30 minutes of it. You're like, well, shit, 30 minutes in, like, do I just, just keep going? Or like, this isn't really any good at all. And so now you've developed that pause mechanism when you're on Netflix, where you're like, I don't know if I want to commit to something because 30 minutes from now, I want to be happy that I chose what I chose. Right. So you end up spending this extra time hoping that you're making the right decision. I mean, I'll admit it. My wife and I sit here, if we sit down for Netflix, we go, okay, and we look at the score that's on Netflix, and then we'll look it up on IMDb, and we'll look it up on Rotten Tomatoes and try to get, like, this average score, like, okay, on average, it looks like it's about 70% cool. So I think we got a good chance. <laughs> like, right. it's insane that we spend this much time hoping that we're not going to watch or listen to something shitty because there's such a plethora of options out there. I know. We need to go back to the good old days where you just – judged a book by its cover, picked it out, and then you were fucking stuck with it. <laughs> and if it was a movie, you had to watch it over and over. We need to <laughs> right. We need to go back to buying that summer camp C D that I just mentioned and like, damn it, it might be terrible, but shit, I made that choice and I'm sticking with it. But it's mine, damn it. I made the decision. I was the same <laughs> but way with my summer camp C D. With Dynamite Hack. <laughs> I bought the Dynamite Hack C D. You might remember their cover of oh. Boys in the Hood and then Literally nothing else on that CD mattered. <laughs> That's the '90s in a nutshell, though, man. That one, one or two like songs, like "Holy shit, this is awesome." You're like, "Who made the rest of this? Like, what is this?" Right, exactly. You can tell that was probably just like, "All right, guys, we recorded one single. People are <laughs> people love it. We got to put nine more to fill fill up an album, and let's put you on <laughs> yeah. tour." <laughs> And just do yourself a favor and play that single last. Otherwise, people will be yeah. leaving. And if you're smart, play first and last. Yeah. Get them off with a bang and then close them out with a bang. 
perfect. <laughs> That's true. Uh, but yeah, and uh, just to kind of get the ball rolling here because we've having such a great uh, conversation, it's we got to get down to some business here because uh, sure. the reason why we have a mutual working relationship is because Mr. Milky, you have your own recording label, your own record label, Revival Recordings. I do. I have a humble little label that I started in my kitchen in Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania, when my wife and I first got married. That's that's when the idea spawned. We were living on Main Street in one of the tiniest towns in central Pennsylvania when I was like, I, I kind of want to get this idea rolling. I, I'd always wanted to do it. Um, it was, it's been a dream of mine since day one, you know, playing in a band, getting to do the rock and roll thing was definitely a big one, but I, I wanted to make sure that it was something I could do forever or, you know, feasibly forever. Whereas I wanted to, to be where my career was winding down. I could take the knowledge I gained and the experience I'd gained and help other people. And I, and I wanted, I always wanted the label to be sort of the anti-industry label, uh, the music industry, and rightfully so in a lot of ways, gets a really bad reputation. And I want to be the little piece of that industry where people can come to feel safe and can can know that their label is run by an artist for artists, and it's about maintaining the visions they have for better or for worse, and never compromising that. Well, I'll tell you what, just speaking of uh, having a label uh, that that has the artist's best uh, interest at heart here, I even asked you, it's like, hey, you know, would you like to play an Alice Santa song on the, uh, on the old podcast? And you said, nay, Sean, nay. I want to talk about a band that's really popping for revival, a band called, uh, what is that, Shatterproof? Shatterproof, yes. And I tell you what, uh, let's give everybody a taste of what Shatterproof is up to. Let's give everybody a taste of what Revival Recordings is up to. And they got a hot new single called Definition of Fine. Does that sound correct to you? <laughs> that sounded absolutely correct. <laughs> All right, fantastic. But yeah, and I figured, uh, you know, let's go ahead and showcase that so that way people can see what it is you're up to on the uh, on the business end of it. And uh, we'll promote uh, Shatterproof. And hey, guys, if it rocks, just come on the podcast. I'd love to have you. So yeah, listeners, wildlings out there, this is Definition of Fine by Shatterproof. Are you talking because you have something to say? Or are you talking cause you're damn afraid of the quiet silence? Really didn't mind it, but never mind, I'm fine with it. My mind has forgotten all of the names, even though I just got them. And my teeth are rotten. But my mind is worse and these light box dreams are starting to hurt me And everyone around the screens to write in this dark little town I feel so alone, everyone's around the gap so awkward What do I do with my hands? I wish your fingers would fill them Until the silence would end Like, what? 
Guys, that was Shatterproof, definition of fine, and you can get that from Revival Recordings. My man, Mr. Milky, back in the virtual Smithsonian with me. Uh, Sean, I got to tell you a story of what just happened to me uh, while uh, we, were, we were breaking, while we were at the song break. So I get up to get a glass of water. As a podcaster, you got you to gotta make sure your throat is, uh, you know, uh, moist. That's gross. Anyway, you got to make sure you have the water uh, on standby. And so I'm walking uh, through the hallway, and all of a sudden, um, I just hear music blaring out of nowhere. It just starts up out of nowhere, and uh, super loud. And I'm like, holy shit, what is this? Why is this happening to me from like this spare office, like my roommate's office? I was like, what is going on in here? And uh, I have some neighbors that live across the street, and they like to party. And I think sometimes they get drunk and connect to the wrong Bluetooth device. And so (laughs) from time to time, they will connect to a stereo or or computer or something and blast music through our uh, Bluetooth items. And if you ever want to get the shit scared out of you at about 1030 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, that's a good way to do it. That would be absolutely terrifying. Yeah, so here I am minding my own business, and they were playing Ghost of all things. I was like, "Oh, can you have like a more evil song that you were, you know, playing in my uh, <laughs> in my hallway?" Come on now. So well, I think that would have been crazier as if a, a shitty '90s single happened to start blasting, as that's what we were talking about. Yeah, I know that, that would freak me out way more. Exactly, that would have been <laughs> uh, witchcraft or. Like, a, like if a Verve pipe single came on or some shit. Where a it, bittersweet symphony. Some band that was... <laughs> if the Cruel Intentions soundtrack came on, guys, I would be fucking out of here. All right? There would be no... Then we would just assume that <laughs> not only was this podcast bugged, but that same person had access to your Bluetooth stuff. So. Dude, it's gonna be like the. It would be like the Blair Witch Project, where you would just, you know, the podcast would just be me screaming... The second half, I'd be me screaming and running out the door, never to be heard from again. And then someone will find the tapes, find the tapes, because I'm recording, like I said earlier, on my Talkboy tape recorder, obviously, and then they're going to publish that out in the world. So, fun fun times. But, okay, so let's get, let's get back to business here. So, you decided that you're going to preserve your legacy in so many words. You're going to do something after your music career is done by helping others out with their musical career. So tell me about tell me about Revival. Tell the listeners out there about Revival Recordings and uh, maybe the, the beginnings to where you are now and uh, what's good. Yeah, so I mean, it's our, we've operated under the mantra of good music by good people to kind of go back to what we were talking about before that break. And because the, the whole concept here is, and something I've wholeheartedly believed in and have tried to build my career out of it is that You know, there's a lot of ways to the top. You can crawl and scratch. You can stab people in the back. You can sell out. You can do all this sort of thing. But I also think there's another way to getting to success, and that's doing things your own way and being patient and surrounding yourself with other people who believe in that idea. Um, And it might take a little longer to get there, but I still believe that you absolutely can get there. And while you may never achieve the level of success of some, Success is so defined by, you know, your own thoughts and wishes that this is a place you can come to 
to get you to where you're trying to go without having to compromise any of your beliefs as a person or as an artist. And um, luckily for me, in the early days when, again, it was just an idea that I was ready to launch in my kitchen, I had a good friend, Adam Fisher, who used to play in a band called Fear Before the March of Flames. And it was an enormous influence on me. But he, he had started a, a solo project called All Humans. And I had a conversation with him. I was like, look, you're probably going to throw this up online or do whatever you're going to do with it. How about you just let me do it? And we can do it through this company that I'm trying to build and this, that, and the other. And so I was, he was kind enough to allow me to do that. You know, and from there, I went to my sister for a project we had been wanting to do together for a while called Tempe Paris, and we did that. And all of this was just learning. I mean, I, I failed so much back in those days and, and still continue to fail. And to me, failing is how you build success. You know, you don't learn from the things that you succeed in. You learn when you fail. And um, But I, I owe so much to, to the two of them for allowing me to just take something that they were passionate about and kind of run it through this new thing I was trying to do. But I, I can probably say that I went from releasing records on TuneCore, as anybody can do, uh, to having, you know, been distributed through Warner Brothers, through Subdistro deals, and through audio recordings through Subdistro deals, and now, you know, working directly with Sony and, and doing some amazing things there. And, you know, I just don't want to go understated that all of this has been done with complete on-the-ground hard work by me and the team surrounding me and all the amazing people I get to work with that... We've taken this idea of good music by good people and, and have proven that you can continuously climb year after year and, and get towards certain goals. And we're nowhere near, you know, the goals that we want to ultimately attain, but thanks to the wonderful people we get to work with and, and the amazing artists that believe in us and, you know, ink their name on deals with us because they believe in what we're doing, we're lucky enough to be where we are now. And you said something that really uh, resonates with me, and I've said it m many times before, but... Listeners, if you're going to take something away uh, from this uh, conversation, here's a great one. Here's a great thing to take away. Failure leads to success. Success happens because you have failed time and time again, and you have honed your craft, and you've sharpened your rough edges, and uh, it's, you know, success happens whenever, um, you know, preparation meets opportunity, you know? So how do you prepare? You fail a hundred thousand times, and then when the opportunity uh, is right... Uh, you strike while the iron's hot, man. While you're laser focused, you know. That's, Absolutely, I'm, it, a, I'm a I'm a huge. I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm, I'm cutting you off. No, you're fine. You're fine. But just to kind of um, add to that is just simply. Uh, I know in this world, it's a it's kind of scary to fail because if you fail, um, it seems like you're failing on such a uh, broad stage or such a huge stage because of the internet, and people love to you know film people failing and people ridicule people that fail. Um, but you know what, dude, uh, don't worry about that shit and just fail and just do it. And, uh, you know, just make it happen. Okay. Because, uh, the real failure is just not trying. Oh, I, I can't, I can't preach that enough. You said that very well. That's, it's something I, I'm trying to sell my kids at their very young age. And I still have to remind myself of, you know, and it's all about the people you surround yourself with. Look, failing sucks. It hurts. It's not fun. But taking those failures and turning them into something that can make you better and can take you to the next level, it's that whole, you know, cheesy cliche of one step forward, two steps back, but it's, it's absolutely the truth. Like, and it's, it's those two steps back that matter, because if you want to get that step forward, you probably are going to take two steps back to do it. And, you know, I'm a big, big fan of sports, have been my whole life, and my favorite sport is baseball, and there's a large reason for that, and it's that it is a game of failure. That's what baseball is, statistically. Those who are the greatest baseball players of all time failed less than the guys who aren't. And, you know, <clears throat> if you think about things like guys who hit a lot of home runs and who hit really well, it's because when they struck out, when there was a pitcher who got the best of them, they go and they study why. Why did I fail there? And they take that failure and they learn how to better themselves because of it why I'm obsessed with the sport. It's why I bring a lot of that sport into the way I run my company and, and the way I live my life is that, you know, if you focus on the failure for too long, it eats you alive and then you turn yourself into nothing. But if you could take that failure and find how to make it benefit you, 
the next true success. Yeah, and look at it this way. I never thought about baseball being a game of failure, but so for those listening, check this out. These dudes are failing on national television. You know, they're striking out every game, you know, or most games, you know what I'm saying? Or or every so many games, you got people that are striking out, people that are hitting foul balls, people that are getting out, you know what I'm saying? And they're doing it in front of hundreds of thousands of people in attendance and millions watching at home. Um, so, Absolutely. You know, hey. You know, in baseball, it's, it's, a, it's one of the things in life where you can do something right three out of ten times and you're considered great. And that's, to me, that's how you should define your life, too. You're, you're, you're not defined by that seven out, of time, seven out of ten times that you failed. You're defined by that three times out of ten that you succeeded. And I think if you can focus on that, and remind yourself of that on a daily basis and surround yourself with people who can help you remember that in tougher times, then you're automatically succeeding. I like your style, man. This is deep. We could have a whole podcast dedicated <laughs> to just sharing deep thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> I told you, man, if you get me on the right topic, I could go on forever and make this a recurring thing. That's awesome, man. Uh, let me ask you, too, uh, again, just to, to, about business and what have you. I've been noticing... Uh, getting some emails and stuff, and and we originally were going to have this podcast last week, but you kind of like you know you hit me up over the weekend. You're like, man, I'm going to be in you know Mexico, or we're playing in South America. I'm going to have to reschedule. <laughs> what is it like uh, playing in South America of all places? Like, I, I it's we never had an opportunity to do that. Canadian dates we've done, and and you know you hear about bands touring. Europe, Japan, but what is South America like when it comes to punk rock and roll? We we you know we've we've done we're blessed and grateful enough to have toured a lot of this planet, and everywhere is great for their own various reasons. There are some places, some markets that are tougher than others. The United States, for example, right? Um, but when you get to go down into the Latin American countries like Mexico, like South America, I mean, it's just there's just nothing like it in the entire world. They are just so incredibly devoted and so passionate. Um, we were lucky enough last year to play Fest. We got to play main stage at Fest, which is just crazy. One of the highlights of my career for sure. And, you know, we knew we wanted to go back and try and headline a date in Mexico. We got to play in Mexico City uh, this past weekend. And every time we go down there, we're just like, this is going to be the time where it's like kind of, average right it's kind of not good like we've just been doing this for so long like how on earth does that fan base still is still so devoted to us and, and we played this theater and, and I got to walk out on stage and this theater was just packed top to bottom and it just it's just unbelievable man they're, they they know everything they, they know everything about your band they're so passionate they're so unadulteratedly passionate to your band whereas you know America is a, a market of very much how what have you done for me lately? The Latin American markets in South America. We get to go to Ecuador actually in the beginning of November for the first time ever. We've never been to Ecuador, but like I, I've watched some fan reaction online to us finally coming to Ecuador, and the, you can't ignore that passion. You can't fake that passion that they are already having, and we're not even there yet. And any band who gets experienced that is just. I, I hope that they are as grateful as we are because you just. It's unlike anything else you can experience. It's these people are legitimately so thankful that you're coming to their home and playing for them, and that passion just resonates on the stage, and it makes the show that much better. That's fantastic. Yeah, I've always wanted to. Uh, uh, I don't know. I see see more of the world, and uh, you know, I I have seen like other artists and stuff, and you'll see their you know their concerts in Brazil in front of you know. 400,000 people or some crazy, some craziness. And you're just like, man, that that's a devoted country of people that want to see rock and roll. It's, it's amazing to me. And I mean, it's, you know, America is the, arguably the birthplace of rock and roll. And you think about to bring it full circle back to the Beatles, you know, all the Beatles wanted to do is get to America, you know, and it's, it's kind of always been the way it was, and but it's just so interesting how we have it here. We are rock and roll here, and yet everybody's so jaded to it. And it's like, eh, what have you done for me lately? 
you know, I, I truly believe that, and not just our band, but, but any bands who are popular in, you know, other nations, especially Latin American nations, you could go down there 10 years from now. You could have not played a guitar for 10 years, tell them you're going to come down and play a show and you're going to pack that place out because they just, they care so much and they're so passionate about it. It's amazing. Let me ask you this question. We are wrapping up uh, or winding down, I should say. We don't have to wrap up, but I want to ask you this question because uh, I think this is going to be a good one. You you know, America being the birthplace of, of, of rock and roll, maybe. Uh, wh- who would you say is the greatest American band. Like if you were to say, this is the band we would put in a time capsule. This is the best representation of American music band wise. Let's not say Elvis, you know, let's not say, you know, Chuck Berry or something like that. Who would you say, what band would you say is the shiniest, shiniest example of American rock and roll? Yeah. It's so tough because you, you immediately took a couple of artists out of the equation because I, I truly believe that rock and roll began as individuals, and it, it, it sort of developed into the whole concept of a band and everything like that, and it, it almost feels unfair to say, oh, this band defines rock and roll, because then I feel like I'd be doing a disservice to somebody like an Elvis, who, it's, for me, it's hard to say that it wasn't him, man. He, he was the original cool and like, isn't that what rock and roll is, right? That's isn't that true. what rock and roll is at its core? Is cool. Like, when you go to see a band that you love, why do you love them? It's because it's fucking cool, man. Right? Like, you, you watch what they do, and you're like, Jesus, that is just the coolest thing I've ever seen. And you know, he kind of invented that cool. Yeah. And I, I feel like to to name any band specifically would be to name any number of peers that were right alongside them who kind of followed the creation of it by Elvis and, and Chuck Berry and, and those guys who were just like almost daring people to be as cool as them. Like I dare you to be cooler <laughs> than me. Like it was just such an arrogance and that arrogance was so fucking cool. Like that's what made it cool. I think that America may have invented rock and roll, but when it comes to when, the reason why I asked the question about the band is because honestly it escapes me because I think Europe perfected the rock and roll band. I guess that would be where the line is drawn. It, they perfected the rock and roll band. Sure. And it almost, that kind of creates a whole other subset of conversation we could have of, you know, what is, who is responsible for the success of any one thing, right? Like in flying home from Mexico city, my wife watched the movie, the founder, which is about McDonald's. Right. And, Basically, some dude came in, and these other two guys had this great idea, and he comes in and just takes it and runs with it, and he is what turned McDonald's into what it is today, but it wasn't his baby, right? Like, he he didn't birth this idea. He took this idea and he made it great. So the argument is kind of Elvis or the Beatles. Who was it? Was it Elvis who was who had the courage to do this thing that nobody had done before? Or do you give credit to the Beatles who went, yeah, I see what you're doing, but if you do it like this, you're going to make, it's just going to be greater. And there, it's, there'll be four Elvises you know, on like, stage at once. <laughs> what was that? it will be like, yeah, we're, we're going to take this idea where it's you're Elvis, you're cool. Well, there's going to be the equivalent of four Elvises on stage at once. We're all going to be right, cool, exactly. but there's four of us exactly. and everyone can have their favorite. Right. Absolutely. And it's, that's where it gets really tough of where credit and credit is due. And this, again, full circle, what is the definition of success? Is it, is it popularity? Is it financial? Is it artistic integrity? Is it, you know, who created the idea? I think success can just be defined on so many levels. And I think we as a people are so obsessed with rankings and lists and, you know, questions like you just asked, not that they're not fun. I enjoy questions like this. It's what spawns conversation. But at the end of, at the end of the day, can't we just say they're all great, that they're all responsible for it in different ways. And it's a shame that we have to always rate and rank and put people in certain positions. Whereas to me, I, I just love to go. I love Elvis. I love Chuck Berry. I love the Beatles. I, I just want to love all of it. I don't want to have to, Compare and contrast at the end of the day. For conversation's sake, I love it because it, 
it's wonderful to talk about. But at the end of the day, we can sit here and debate it. But when I fall asleep tonight, I'm going to go, I just love all of it. And you know I'm what? so grateful that all that exists. You're just like you're just like Michael Bolton from Office Space. You, you know, what's your favorite Michael Bolton song? <laughs> you know what? I kind of like them all. You know, I'm the same <laughs> exactly, way. Exactly, <laughs> dude. Dude, you, you with the film references, man. You're killing me tonight. It's great. You know what? I kind of <laughs> like them all. But yeah. And I think, honestly, whatever the definition of success is uh, to everyone out there, I would say you're a shining example of someone that is definitely um, getting pretty darn close to success if you haven't gotten it already because, I mean, you had a, a band that took you all over the world. You've got a record label where you're able to give back to other bands, help them live their dreams, give back to your community. Uh, in Raleigh, I know that you're, you do a lot of community stuff there. You've got a beautiful wife. You've got a beautiful family. And uh, that's pretty successful to me. Yeah, if you were to just, but that's just one man's opinion. Damn it! I appreciate that, man, and that's that's absolutely how I would put a bow on that. Is you know, there's plenty of bands I toured with, plenty of bands that we took out when they were nothing, who've gone on to quote unquote bigger and better things than we ever have. But where I define success, I am successful in my mind. I've I've gotten to maintain my artistic integrity. I've gotten to build a fan base to appreciate what it is we try to do. I've gotten to build this label and, and sign bands and, and hopefully see their careers on to bigger and better things. And, you know, you said it best, beautiful wife, beautiful kids. I, I couldn't be happier with where I am. And that's how I define success. So in my eyes, I, I am succeeding. And in my eyes, you are succeeding as well. And honestly, I'm, I'm kind of just taking the same approach here with the podcast. If I can just talk about myself for a second, because, you know, w once uh -huh, baby uh, broke up, you know, we achieved, you know, somewhat of a level of success, more success than I ever thought we would do. And I got to do things that I never thought I'd be able to do or things that I dreamed of doing. So to me, I'm like, that's awesome. Um, but with this podcast, you know, I'm like, now I'm able to actually show more of myself that people didn't get a chance to see before. And I'm literally helping myself by helping everybody around me. You know, I'm giving people a platform to promote their their, uh, you know, their music or whatever it is that whatever their dreams are that they're chasing. Here's a platform where you can talk about it. Here's a platform to showcase these people's personalities. And uh, in turn, you know, people are tuning in, listening, and it's helping me out at the same time. So it's helping me by helping them. And uh, I get a lot of joy out of it. And I feel uh, even for me, like I feel successful as well. I mean, isn't that what success is? Is joy, that feeling of joy that you just talked about? Like that's, if you get to feel that, then you're you are succeeding. That that's what everybody searches for is joy, right? Some happiness, some good feeling, the feeling good about what you're doing. And if you're doing that, you're great, man. That that's that's what it's all about. You you can't let others define what your happiness and what your success is. And you know that sounds like that's what you're doing with your podcast. That's absolutely what we're doing with revival. We we are the ones determining what success is, not the music industry and not anybody else. Well, I'll tell you what, man, I don't think we can say anything better than that. And, uh, you really wrapped it up, uh, perfectly. Uh, as we are, uh, winding down, let me just ask you, where can people find, uh, your projects on, on the internet as far as your music or as far as revival goes and all that good sort of thing. Yeah. I mean, all of my music now pumps through my label, which I'm very lucky to be able to do. So you can find, Anything and everything related to what we're doing at Revival Rec, that's R E C F dot com. Everything flows through there. All right, guys. Well, RevivalRex.com, check it out. And uh, you get to see uh, what Alisana, uh, Alisana, let me get, let me go ahead and correct myself there. You can see what Alisana's <laughs> been up to, what uh, um, all the good bands are, man. The Funeral Portrait, uh, Misery Loves Company. You got a lot of bangers going coming out of uh, Revival. So. Absolutely, man. It's going well. Actually, Funeral Portrait just today announced a tour with Emery, which is amazing. Things are things are happening, man. It's really cool. That's fantastic. I had Lee on the show here, actually. We had a great conversation. He was an awesome guest. Love that dude, and uh, I wish him all the best. And listeners out there, uh, check out the bands that are on uh, Revival Recordings, and uh, you might find just something that you like. Uh, and if you like this podcast, check it out on iTunes, Stitcher, uh, it's on YouTube. It's on any podcatcher that you enjoy. Uh, of course, you can always uh, follow what I'm up to on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all that good sort of thing. And if you like it, please uh, you know, share, subscribe, tell your friends, and all that good sort of thing. And uh, Sean, 
this is the, this is that point Strong. of the conversation where I think we need to <laughs> slightly tip our hats because we know that we're too we're too cool to be spelled S H A U N. And then that's I think that's absolutely right. I think we need to. Okay, this is where we go back to sort of being enemies again. We were friends for the last hour plus, but unless the UN walks in the room, man, I'm sorry, but you know, you will forever be an EAN. That's true. I'm wearing all black with a black cowboy hat. You're obviously wearing all white with a white cowboy hat. Uh, yeah, of course, I am. And then th- this is where we this is where we tip our hats, and then uh, we we ride off in opposite directions into the sunset. By the way, guys, we've been on horseback this whole time. I forgot to tell you that. It's the entire... I don't know how we <laughs> kept the uh, the click-clack of the horseshoes silent, yeah. but somehow the magic of technology has allowed us to do that. Guys, those were not two coconuts clacking around. Those were actually horse hooves. So, yes. <laughs> but yeah, you know what, guys? Thanks so much for tuning in. Sean, thank you so much for doing this. I definitely appreciate hey. you. Hey. Sending all my love out Had there. Had a wonderful time, man. Your way. Uh, in Raleigh there. Say hi to all the team and uh, the family. Uh, we miss we miss all you guys, and uh, yeah, we have to come back on here soon. We'll do a part two, okay? Definitely will, man. Sounds great. Have all a right. great time. All right, brother. Well, listeners out there, this has been the Sean vs. Wild Podcast.